Um, I will pause for comments because I want Colleen to introduce Scott more properly than I certainly can. But appreciate everybody being here today. Um, two, just kind of housekeeping items that I can take care of now. Um, no, we had stated that we would like to use um, General Assembly uh, meeting rooms and their facilities and capabilities in the future. However, the I guess the second Wednesday of each quarter that we have uh, set in meeting for this year, uh, it does not work for General Assembly members. We can they said it would be needed to be the first week or the third. I think it's the first day and the third Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. So we're, we're a week off of the kids yeah. that would allow us to utilize their facilities and working at this, et cetera. Mm -hmm. So if folks are generally okay with that, I think we'd like to explore shifting the meeting in October by one week so we can take advantage of, of that central location, um, maybe forward, maybe backwards, but we'll work with folks in the clerk's office to, to find the room and capabilities, hopefully. October and and you folks necessarily opposed to that? I don't know whether they offer extra parking facilities to Unimor on that. I think they did. I think that's that would be the, really that idea. was the draw. Um, but we'll we'll check back in on that. Um, I would I guess if it's a point with a quorum. Um, Entertain a motion for approval of the January 10, excuse me, January 9 or 10 meeting minutes. Second. All right. Then properly moved and seconded. All those in favor of approving the minutes, please reply by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? All right. The minutes are adopted. Um, with that, I'll hand it over to Colleen to introduce our first guest presenter. Sure. Um, so thank you, um, Scott, so much for joining us today. Um, so I, I know that the authority has talked about, um, you know, what role does the independent system operator of our region play in the ability to develop solar and storage in Virginia? And so that's what kind of brought on this idea of inviting PJM, which is the Pennsylvania, New Jersey, Maryland Interconnection, or our independent system operator, to give an overview of their um, function in the energy system and um, what's going on in terms of new developments. Uh, so, uh, Scott, I'll leave you to give yourself yep. a short introduction. Sure. But again, thank you on behalf of the authority. For sure. Coming. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. I'm quite comfortable here, so I think I'll just stay here for everybody's okay with that. Fine. Um, so, yeah, let me introduce myself. Uh, I've been with PJM for um, 13 years now. I came uh, right out of graduate school, and um, uh, I'm actually quite interested to hear from our second speaker today because I came out of graduate school studying electric vehicle to grid technology, and I was also my thesis on offshore wind power, but my hands are actually getting dirty on figuring out how to use electric vehicles as mobile batteries and aggregating them together and getting them into markets, how can they earn revenue for customers, and this whole vehicle to grid concept. And that sort of led me to understand what PJM was. Uh, because they were the only entity that was really offering these wholesale markets where you can bid in and earn revenue. You know, local utilities don't really offer programs like that. Um, and I got very, very interested in what PJM was, and um, and thankfully they, they offered me a job after graduate school, and I've been there ever since. And uh, I think the reason I've been there for so long is because the work that PJM does is both incredibly important um, for the, the regional economy and endlessly complicated and interesting, in my opinion. Uh, there is something to learn every single day that this organization and um, it, it keeps the job very, very interesting. So, um, because it has such a large role in the regional reliability of the power system, and because there's a lot of complexity in what we do, I don't have the time today to really go through all of that. But what I'd like to do is offer a very brief introduction to what the company is, what our role is, 
Um, and then that just dive into a few topics I think are of interest to this group um, and kind of what we're doing in those areas as it relates to solar and storage and what I would just generally call our approach to the energy transition. This is um, this is sort of front and center for everybody in the industry, but particularly as the entity that's charged with maintaining the reliable operation of a bulk electric power system. We have got to figure out how we're going to make this energy transition reliably and cost effectively. Um, and so it's very front and center for us, and uh, it's really an incredible um, undertaking that you know not just PJM but all of the you know the, the community involved in operating the power system is going to have to uh, achieve. So I'll touch in uh, you know on a couple of those topics as well. Um, stop me at any point with any questions that you have, and we can go off script here. I, whatever you would like to get into, I'm happy to get into it. All right, we'll go to the next slide. So for those who really have never heard of PJM, we'll go to the next slide. Um, I wanted to just kind of go over who we are and what we do. Um, we are what's called an independent systems operator, also called a regional transmission organization. PJM is technically a regional transmission organization, an RTO. And the reason that we are an RTO is because we do regional transmission planning for this region. There are other similar companies that are just independent systems operators because they don't do regional transmission planning. They just operate the hybrid transmission network. But this is kind of the, the footprint, if you will, of PJM. Uh, we aren't a traditional utility, so we own no assets. The only assets that we own are office buildings and control centers and you know IT assets. That's it. It's a relatively small company, generally speaking. We're about 950 uh, full-time employees. We're headquartered in, in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania, just west of Philadelphia. We have two control centers. One is in uh, Valley Forge, and one is at sort of a, a little bit of a more remote site, about 45 minutes from there. Um, and but we serve 65 million people uh, within that region. It's about a, a, a fifth of the U.S. GDP. So. Again, the impact that we have and the, the importance of the role of maintaining the reliability of the bulk power system is tremendous. Um, I would say one of the things that makes PJM different from some other independent systems operators in the US is that we are a multi-state RPO. As you can see by the footprint there, we cover 14 different jurisdictions, 13 states plus DC. Um, there are other independent systems operators that operate just within a single state. California comes to mind, uh, New York and Texas are all single state independent systems operators. Same general function, same general role in the industry, but they do it for just uh, one state, usually just one state. Um, but there are seven of these types of companies in the US. And there's two in Canada. Um, the rest of the country that isn't covered by an independent systems operator, that function is served by the incumbent vertically integrated utility. And there's still wide swaths of the country that, that operate in that way. Um, but this is a, sort of a different model. All right, let's get to the next slide. So what do we do? Um, our focus is the reliable operation of the bulk power system. Bulk power system, generally speaking, is anything 100 kV and above from a transmission line perspective. Um, so it's not the local distribution wires, it's the high voltage transmission wires. Again, we don't own any of those, but the companies that own them essentially see control of those assets the PJM to monitor, make decisions that are reliability based um, in order to maintain the security of the system. So to do that, there's really three main focus areas. There's operations. This is kind of the day to day, you know, 
hour to hour, minute to minute, second by second um, operation of that power system. We've got, uh, again, two control centers that operate uh, what we call hot hot. So there's it's not like a main control center and backup. They operate in parallel. The dispatchers that are in those control centers can actually be at either site. And they operate um, uh, via you know video, telecast, and, and so forth to coordinate. Um, and that's really what's going on on a day to day basis. They're making decisions to turn power plants on, uh, ramp power plants up, turn power plants off. Uh, they're calling transmission owners to make switching decisions. They're monitoring the system and making sure that it remains reliable. Helping to do that is this other layer that's very, very closely coupled with our operations, which are the wholesale power markets. The wholesale power markets are something that we use to maintain the reliable operation of the system at the least possible cost. So we operate a market to make sure we're scheduling enough generation to meet load for the next day, to make sure we have enough reserves on the system should we have a power system event, like a transmission line uh, coming out of service unexpectedly or a generator coming out of service unexpectedly. We want to make sure we've got enough resources to fill in when that happens. So we, we run these markets. Um, there are there's various markets, energy capacity, ancillary services. Um, that's kind of the suite of things that we need to make sure the system is reliable, literally second to second, years in the future. There's different time scales associated with them. There's different scale in terms of the megawatts. Some of the markets are smaller, some are larger. Um, Eighty percent of all of the revenue that flows through PKM comes through the energy markets, the real-time energy market and day ahead market. But that's the bulk of the kind of revenue. Um, on average, PJM is clearing like something between 40 and 50 billion dollars per year through these markets. Um, and again, 80 percent that's really in the energy market. Um, and we are just the market operator. We don't take ownership of the uh, financial transactions. Um, so we're just the, the market operator in that way, kind of like you can think of us as like the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ. We're just sort of the facilitator of the market, the technology, um, but it's really the, the counterparties that are, are transacting that market. The market and operations is very closely uh, tied together. And then the other thing we do is we do regional transmission planning. So we have a, a mandate to look out 15 years. There's actually a recent regulatory um, a regulatory order that is going to require us to look out 20 years. Um, but we're doing long-term look-ahead planning, economic forecasting, load forecasting, um, coordinating with our transmission owners and other member companies about other large scale changes, new generation coming on, old generation coming offline, taking all of those factors and becoming a model every single year that looks out as far as 15 years and getting a picture of what kinds of transmission upgrades we're going to need to keep the system reliable under those different conditions. And part of the reason that you need to look out so far is because it's not easy to build transmission. Um, and so you need a long look ahead on these things to understand what's coming down the pipe and get those plans in place. Um, and you know, they, they definitely adjust like as you get closer and closer to the time frame. Um, transmission projects can get canceled, other things come up where it's like there's a more immediate need, but generally speaking, we're taking that long-term view and trying to plan for it. So those are the three main kind of pillars of what PJM does and what our, our mandate is. Um, any questions about any of them? You did a good job of explaining it. Thanks. Yes, there's a lot going on in each of these pillars. Um, but again, when people look to us, they think of keeping the grid reliable, operating this you know, $50 billion market, which is the largest wholesale market in the world, and 
planning the bulk power transmission system for the future. Making those decisions, our board actually votes on those transmission plans. And then when they are approved, and FERC also approves them, we then sort of give those projects to the people who actually kind of build, own, and maintain those assets. Again, because that's not us. But you know, we're the entity that might say, a lot of data center load growth happening in Virginia. We're going to need a new transmission line here, here, and here. Um, here are different options. Here's what we think mo most cost effective. And we sort of solidify that plan and it gets voted and approved on. And then we would say to Dominion or perhaps a merchant transmission developer, go, go build this project. You commented on the first, first come, first serve, which is first time, first first ready. Can you comment on that? that yeah, that's it. I'm a landowner. I'm not a, I'm not yeah, a, sure. Yeah. yeah, sure. Um, I can comment on that a little bit and we will get into to that uh, in a little bit more detail. but. That, that is kind of within this regional planning, um, but it's a specific part of that related to generator interconnection. So part of this regional planning is understanding what new generators are connecting to the grid and how that's changing the transmission dynamics um, in the region. And so we operate something called an interconnection queue. Any generator that is gonna to connect to the transmission system needs to come through the PJM interconnection queue to get studied by PJM and the transmission owner. <clears throat> um, and I think what you're referencing is um, we used to have a first come, first serve approach to generator interconnection. The earlier you get in the queue, the earlier you will be studied. Um, we've made a pretty significant change to first ready, first serve. Um, generally speaking, the reason for doing that is because we want the best, the most ready, the most viable generator interconnections to move forward faster than some that may not be quite as ready or um, not yet, yeah, not quite as uh, as viable, if you will. And so that's the that's the sort of rationale for switching that methodology. Did that switch happen? Or has it already taken place? It has taken place. Yeah, um, it's it's been a long time in the works. So I'm trying to think of the exact dates um, associated with it. But we it took about a year in our state process, and I think that started somewhere maybe 2021 would be my guess um, to come up with this new approach that everybody, that all of our stakeholders could sort of agree on. And they did this whole governance process in PJM as to how new proposals get made, but think of it like small government. Um, and that took about a year. And then we filed it with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and they approved it. And then we put it into implementation. So I think it went into implementation sometime in 2023. Um, so it's been sort of active for quite some time. Is that you might have prepared remarks later, but I'm curious if that's cut down on the size of the queue and maybe the time to get through that information queue process more. Um, for sure, the second part has definitely taken place. It's making it's it's going to make it uh, much faster and more efficient, and I would argue more fair um, for again these more viable, more ready projects to get faster treatment um, because part of the issue with the queue was you had a lot of speculative projects that come into the queue. And speculative has sort of a negative connotation to it. I don't really mean it in that way. I just mean a lot of people is a fairly low um, barrier to entry to just get into the queue. And if you think you might build a generator or you think you might build one generator, but you're not quite sure where, you could put five projects in the queue, knowing very well you're only going to build one of these. You're just sort of waiting for the study results to come back to see where's the cheapest place to interconnect. And that was doing a lot to sort of gum up the wheels of the queue process. Um, and then adding to that, of course, is just the sheer need for more generation on the system. So the queue is just growing in size, a number of factors. Uh, uh, contributing to that. 
but it was getting to a point where it was just unwieldy. It was just taking way too long for projects to get through the queue. We PJM was burdened with way more projects than we had ever had in our history um, and to study. And so we had a sort of resource problem on our side. And so that was the, you know, it all sort of came to a breaking point. And we said, we got to work with the stakeholders and come up with a different system for this just a so that's where we are. And I do have some more specific um, nuances on the interconnection process. Ready to move? Yes. Okay, so just some analogies that make it a little bit easier to understand what we're doing. The planning function is very similar to urban plan. We've got new development in this county. We need to extend bus and rail and roads and sewer and all of that, like urban planning. It's very similar to that. We're taking into account a lot of different factors across that entire 14 state region. And we're saying, okay, what is the, what's the best choices to make to adapt the transmission system to what we expect in the next 15 or 20 years? Operation is very similar to air traffic control. I think when you think of what it's like in an air traffic control tower, right? You've got planes taking off, planes landing, you got to make sure these planes aren't running into each other. And they're also trying to do that in the most efficient manner possible, right? Like ideally you want sort of a plane taking off and a plane landing um, like at the same time. You want to maximize the capability of that landing strip. And that's what our operators are doing. Um, they're making sure that the grid is staying at 60 Hertz, balanced constantly all of the time and trying to do that in a way that is the most efficient um, and most reliable uh, without anything breaking. So that's what they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then the markets is sort of this layer that is adding transparency and price information for buyers and sellers to make efficient decisions. And it's pricing the very services that our operators need to make the grid reliable. So um, <clears throat> we need to match demand and generation minute by minute, right? We've got a five minute energy market that's pricing 10,000 points in that whole PJM system every five minutes. It's extremely granular. It's very similar to how security is traded. Um, really high volume, really granular pricing, you know, um, lots of transparency and liquidity. We also need to make sure that tomorrow we've got enough generators on call to meet that load. So we forecast the load for tomorrow. We run an energy market that says, hey, do we have enough generators and will that solution be reliable for tomorrow? We price that product, hourly product, and um, generators clear so that the generators know, great, I'm going to run tomorrow and I'm going to run at a price that will at least cover my costs. If not, um, I'll make a profit. Um, and then we go kind of go out from there and run something called a capacity market. And the capacity market makes sure that three years from now, we have enough generation and load response resources on the system to meet our, our forecasted uh, peak load, both in summer and in winter. So we run like a more forward market Again, to make sure we're sending a price signal to resources that if you can generate electricity or turn load off three years from now, we'll pay you to be there to do that. Yeah, it's just a market signal, very similar to like a forward option in a financial app. Okay, this is what the control room looks like. Um, so there's uh, also an open invitation if you're interested to come to PJM and kind of see this in action, we'd love to have you. This is a picture taken from what we call the mezzanine, so above the control room um, where visitors can be, um, and you can have a look at everything that's going on here. But I mean, what you see is just like a massive amount of information that our operators are having to deal with uh, on a day to day basis. But these screens are, it's very scientific how they're laid out. It has a lot to do with the personalities of the operators and what very specific information they need to look at quickly to make a very quick decision. Um, 
but it looks totally chaotic, I think, to the sort of common person. You look at this and be like, how are you, how are you operating the grid with this information? Um, but it's very specific how it's laid out. In general, I'll just kind of walk you through it very generally. That is the transmission system up there. And we're, it's geographic to a certain extent. Virginia is like somewhere in the middle on the right most side there. Chicago are the purple lines out there. That's a kind of geographic, but that's the full transmission system. That's the very high voltage lines, 500 kV, 765 kV, uh, 300 um, kV. That's, that's what's going on in that system. And basically what that system is telling you is the voltages on those transmission lines are within normal limits. And then things start to light up and sound start to go off if that's not the case. This big column, all these columns here are generators and typically they're what we call quick start generators. Usually it's a lot of combustion, gas combustion turbines, but that gives the operators a very quick picture of what combustion turbines are available for me to turn on or turn off. And um, where are they? And sort of what's their contributing factor if I turn them on or turn them off? So it's just a quick list of some generators in the PGM system that the operators can use in real time to make quick decisions should they need to. Um, it's, it's, it's a, uh, I would call that a short list of the total amount of generators in the PGM system. But many generators in the PGM system, when you turn them on, you can't just quickly turn them off or quickly turn them back on. So those are the, like, the fine tune switches. I would, I was uh, to make an analogy. What main plate size are those guys? They vary. Um, you know, combustion turbines like a combustion turbine is generally speaking something less than a hundred megawatts. It's just talking about a simple cycle of combustion turbine. But then at a particular site, you can put as many as you want at a site. In you know, in theory. Um, so some of them might be you know, 500 megawatts, others might be 70 megawatts, 75 megawatts, 50 megawatts, smaller sites. I don't think PJM has energy storage anywhere near that magnitude, but are you starting to see entries into your generator table with energy storage? Yes, yeah, certainly. And I mean, storage would absolutely be on that list. I mean, those are mostly gas turbines because that's mostly the sort of the most flexible type resource that we have on the grid today. There might be some other things in there, um, but I think mostly that's gas turbine. Yeah, as soon as we start getting the sort of, you know, one hour, two hour, four hour batteries on the system, which we know are coming, they're coming through the interconnection queue right now, um, they, will, they will certainly be on that list. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, okay, so those are all the generators. In the, um, so a lot of just various information going on here. Most of it has to do with transmission and voltages and switch gear. And then in the middle here, you see something called time, error, and frequency. Frequency is 60 hertz. So the whole job is basically keeping the grid at 60 hertz. Six, zero, dot, zero, 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 zero. But it's rarely at that exact number. Sometimes it's slightly higher, slightly lower. Um, so we, we're constantly balancing that. There's, there's automatic controls that, that have generators do that. There's also some dispatch actions that we can take to make sure that that frequency stays at 60 hertz. But when it's not at 60 hertz, when it's a little bit above or a little bit below, we calculate something called time error. There's some debate in the industry whether this is still relevant, but our clocks used to keep time based on that frequency. They're all now digital, so it's not that maybe relevant for clocks anymore. But we still keep this thing called time error. Time error basically tells you what's the cumulative amount of time that the frequency has been above or below 60 hertz. And so here, like in this particular picture, it's basically telling you the time is eight and a half seconds fast. So any clock in PJM would be running eight and a half seconds faster than it should be. And so there's also a program in place. It's a, it's a regional program uh, across the entire Eastern interconnection, which is a much larger grid than just PJM, 
to get that time error back down to zero. And you kind of take turns who has the responsibility to get that time error back down to zero. It's kind of cool, definitely a little lesser known thing that we do. Again, it's far less relevant in today's world, but it's still something that all grid operators do. It's, it's kind of mandated program by, um, by our reliability regulator. Um, the only other thing I wanted to mention to you, because it's very relevant for today's battery, and I think the next set of batteries as well, is this little, do you see this little box here that has red triangles in the corner and then blue in the middle? It's kind of directly above me right there. Yeah, that's something called our, um, something called our um, uh, ACE, Area Control Error. And part of the job of PJM is to make sure that the frequency and the interchange in and out of PJM. So electrons that are flowing maybe from PJM up into New York or PJM out into MISO that are unscheduled. It's to make sure that the frequency stays as close to 60 hertz as possible and that these unscheduled flows in and out of PJM stay as minimal as possible. And so the two red corners are a, a sort of an unacceptable level of either frequency or this interchange in and out of PJM. So there's a little yellow dot in the middle, in the very middle there. And that little dot, yellow dot is constantly moving. So if you stand in the controller, you can watch it. It just looks like a little squiggly thing that's moving around all the time. If it gets into one of those red areas, a clock starts. And we give ourselves 10 minutes to get it out of one of those red areas. So the operator will make decisions to get that little yellow dot out of the, one of those red areas. The um, are, we're, we're mandated to get it out of in 15 minutes. So we give ourselves a 10 minute clock, gives us a little bit of a five minute buffer. We would technically we would get fined by our reliability regulator if it were to stay in one of those red areas for longer than 15 minutes. Um, so part of what these operators are doing, like boil it way down, is that little yellow dot. <laughs> Just keep that yellow dot right in the middle. Um, that's sort of the video game that they're playing down there. Um, and part of uh, what helps us do that is this market called the regulation market. You may have heard of this if you're in the energy storage business, um, but the regulation market is, a again, a market-based service that has a very real reliability function, and it is to help us keep the frequency of the grid at 60 hertz. We send a signal every two seconds to a battery or a generator to either ramp up a tiny bit or down a tiny bit to keep that help us keep that yellow dot right in the middle. And there's a price that we pay per hour for that service. And PJM, a long time ago, back in 2007, we did a project with um, AES. And just, uh, I guess it was just AES at that time. I don't think there was an energy storage division. Um, we put a one megawatt battery in the parking lot at PJM because we really wanted to understand what this new battery technology was all about, how fast it could actually respond to signals how well it could do this frequency regulation service. And we quickly realized that they're just extremely good at doing this. I mean, I don't have a chalkboard here, but like when a traditional thermal power plant does this service, we kind of send it a signal and it kind of like generally follows that signal, but it's really, you know, it's more like trend line type stuff. When a battery, we send uh, this signal to a battery, the battery follows the signal so well at times you can't even see the signal that's there like it's right on top of that response and um so the industry started to really realize these batteries are very good at providing this service our regulator made a big um uh regulatory requirement that all the rtos start to pay for how well generators provide this regulation service because everyone is sort of recognizing like the existing fleet of generators actually don't do such a great job of providing this service. 
So why don't we just incentivize everybody to do as good a job as they possibly can in providing the service? So there's a whole big regulatory rulemaking around how do you pay generators to follow that frequency regulation signal as well as possible, energy storage or others. Um, and in so doing, it gave energy storage resources uh, quite an advantage and um, an additional incentive to be as good as they possibly can in following that regulation signal. That did a lot to spur the very early set of energy storage resources on the grid across the country um, and certainly in PJM, but it's a very small market. So we only buy about 800 megawatts of this regulation service. We don't need a whole lot of it to just keep the grid sort of balanced. Um, again, PJM is a, to put it in perspective, like our average load is probably about 100,000 megawatts. And for this regulation service, we buy 800. So it's very much just like, again, fine tune knob, a limited set of resources, but they've got a very important job to do. And because they have an important job to do, because the smaller market it tends to command a pretty high price. And so it's a good early entry market for energy storage resources to um, prove their value in the market, I would say, as a new energy technology. <laughs> Um, I should have mentioned when I was beginning that um, the, the group that I work in at PJM is our R&D group. So we had a sort of a, a, a big role in helping understand what battery storage technology meant to the grid. And then as a result, figuring out what new policies do we need to implement to kind of help batteries compete with other generators in the system. Again, we're technology neutral as an operator. We operate these markets. We say, here's the market product. Here are sort of the rules you need to follow to provide that market product. And then we clear a market and establish a price. And we don't pick fuels or pick winners and losers in that process. But part of being an independent operator is that you have to make sure that you're truly being independent and that there aren't any undue barriers to entry for, for certain technologies. So this is kind of part of what my group does at PJM. We sort of help understand new new technologies, how they impact the grid, and then figure out are there new policies we need to be exploring to make sure these new technologies actually have, you know, have a um, a leg to stand on to compete in the market. All right, that's all I'm going to say about the control room. For now, we'll go to the next slide. Oh, okay. Yeah, please. Yeah, questions. Just to connect that to Virginia. So yeah. we have Dominion Power, we have APS. Um, so we have utilities that operate transmission in Virginia. Yes. How does PJM and the utilities that are in Virginia coordinate with each other? Great question. Like Great question. We have a extreme uh, close coordination with the transmission owners. Again, we don't own any of these assets. Our mandate is keep the transmission system reliable and do whatever it is you have to do to maintain that reliability. And as a result of that, sort of a compact that we have with transmission owners, uh, PJM can tell our transmission owners what needs to be done with their physical assets to maintain reliability in the system, and they need to comply with those directions. Um, but they are the ones that will actually take any physical actions on equipment in the grid. So from that control room, our operator can't like push a button to switch out a particular breaker or, um, or, or other equipment in the field. We need to coordinate with the transmission owner to then take that action. So there's a lot of back and forth. I mean, it's still very much like pick up a phone and talk to somebody down there. Um, uh, but that's how we coordinate with the transmission owners. Yeah. And they're what, you know, they have their own control rooms. They're watching their own systems. So, you know, alarms are going off in the PJM control room. They're, they're likely going off in the transmission owner control room too. I say likely going off because um, we have had catastrophic events on the grid throughout the country uh, over, over the years. And um, those alarms, don't always go off when they should go off. Right? This is like a very, um, I don't say common, but um, 
it's it's a it's an issue that has caused a few blackouts in the United States where there is an issue on a transmission line and the alarm doesn't go off to catch it. And so having redundancy of, of alarms, alarming systems is quite important. Um, OK, so that's a lot of background about PJM. Um, I'm just going to provide a couple of comments around um, what we call ensuring a reliable energy transition. This is this is our focus um, at the moment. I mean, we have the day to day focus. We have our core responsibilities, but everything that we're working towards strategically as a company is navigating this energy transition with our stakeholders, with our asset owners, with our state government um, partners, um, navigating this transition in a reliable way. And I really want to underscore a reliable way because if we have reliability issues during this energy transition, it will set back the transition. I think most folks can sort of understand that, um, but I don't think it can be said enough. Um, we've got to make sure we do this in a reliable way. Nobody's going to um, put up with, you know, rolling blackouts or energy rationing in this country um, for the sake of clean energy. It's just, it's, I think it's just a matter of fact. Um, and it doesn't have to be that way. I'm not suggesting that it, that it does have to be that way, but it's just very important to, to sort of underscore that fact. We've got to do this as fast as possible, as cost effectively as possible, but most importantly, uh, in a reliable way. So we've got a number of different um, things that we're working on. A number of different doesn't is not really doing it justice. There's a laundry list of um, actions that we're currently working on that are sort of immediate term. Um, there are some things that are like on the what's next and then there are a few longer terms so if we can go to the next slide oh i just wanted to yeah give you a sense of like where are we on this energy transition in the pjm footprint um if you look at our interconnection queue it is i forget exactly now but maybe let's just call it like 85 percent renewable and storage so if you look at the queue you're going well, this grid is going to be like near 100% renewable very quickly. But what's in reality, what's already on the system looks like this. So this was our fuel mix. This is percent of annual energy generated in PJM last year. Okay, 14.9% coal is what stands out to me and 44% natural gas. 10 years ago, 15 years ago, that was a drastically different story. I think 15 years ago, we were like 60% coal and maybe more like 15% gas. So we've already made an energy transition in PJM and it's been gas replacing coal. That, that already happened. And at that time, we were also sort of sounding, um, you know, not sounding an alarm, but recognizing the fact that there was a very fast energy fuel switch happening in our region. The good news and what made that transition fairly smooth was the fact that we were replacing thermal power plants with other thermal power plants. So generally speaking, it was a relatively easy transition in that respect. A lot of the same qualities that a coal plant brings to the power system a combined cycle of natural gas power plant, for instance. And, and in some instances, you get a lot more reliability value out of a combined cycle natural gas plant is a bit more flexible. But this is where we are. A lot of gas on the system, nuclear sort of staying right where it is um, for the time being, and this coal number shrinking and continuing to shrink. We're only about 7% renewable. And about half of that is wind at the moment. So it's a very small amount of solar currently. 1.4% of our total energy is coming from solar at the moment. But that is probably the fastest growing as well. So just kind of wanted to give you a picture. We're at a very small percentage of renewables in our broader system today. But when you look in that queue, 
you just realize that that's all that's coming in line for the foreseeable future. So that's sort of what this transition is all about. Yeah. So what percent of solar generation do you think PGM could handle without storage coming online? Without storage coming online? It's a hard question to answer. There's a lot of different factors that go into it, but it's a pretty sizable amount without storage. The bigger factor is how much solar can we handle while thermal power plants like gas and coal are retiring? If, you, if, you, if we were to keep all this gas and all this coal on our system, not a single megawatt retired, we could absorb a lot of solar. We could absorb a lot of renewables. I think the bigger concern is some of this older gas is retiring. There's new environmental regulations that are forcing it to retire. And a lot of this coal, even though it's a small number, there's a sizable amount of that coal that's also going to retire. And so the bigger concern is losing thermal resources that bring a lot of reliability value to the system while increasing renewables. So for me, it's really more, we need storage to take the place of or bring the reliability attributes that we get from thermal power plants while adding renewables. Yeah, and we are, if you go to that, there's a web page we have dedicated to this energy transition. Uh, we've been doing a lot of different studies year over year, we call it a living study. We're just constantly putting out analysis as like what this energy transition is looking like, looking at different factors within this energy transition. So we're studying that question, Skyliner, a lot. Um, and like anything, it depends on the assumptions you make and you know, the inputs to the model. But you know, generally speaking, we can still um, absorb a lot of renewables to the PGM system. But as the thermal fleet starts to decline, you need a lot more storage to fill it in or you start to run into reliability problems. You said, you said storage can do a better job on frequency regulation. Yeah. But what what about when you factor in duration? Like, is yeah. if you lose the reliability of thermal and you're trying to deal with the intermittency of wind and solar, is yeah, more you need duration going to get the job done? Yeah. That's good. That's good. Yes. Yeah. So, real, real quickly, this is kind of how we view it. Um, we've got some immediate concerns. The immediate concerns we have are all sort of around supporting resource performance. The resource set that we have today needs to perform as well as possible, sort of maximize the value that we get from it. This includes during things like extreme weather events. This includes things like when we have um, reserve events, those resources that are on the grid need to perform as well as possible. So we're doing a lot of work around this, supporting the performance of the existing fleet of all generator types and demand response. In the near term, we've got a concern around resource adequacy. Thermal generators are retiring and what we're building doesn't replace a thermal generator on a megawatt to megawatt basis. I'm going to talk about that in a second. But the near term concern is, can we meet our peak load during extreme weather conditions in the summer and in the winter, are we going to be able to meet our peak load in the future with the coming set of resources? That's a concern that we've been highlighting. And then the upcoming concern is, okay, let's say we can meet our peak load. Let's say we can meet the energy needs of the system with whatever this new fleet looks like. Are we still going to have enough of these, what we call essential reliability services? to keep the grid reliable. And there's essential reliability services that come with thermal power plants that we have taken for granted for a long, long time. And you, when you replace thermal power plants with things that are um, power electronics um, uh, focused or the interface is a power electronic device rather than a rotating mass, you lose things like inertia, you lose some things like primary frequency response. You can get those out of power electronic devices, but we don't really have a, a, a way of an industry of identifying exactly what those needs are, pricing them. We don't really price them today. We get them 
you know, quote unquote for free. It's not really for free, but we don't we don't explicitly run a market for these reliability services. We just know that these thermal generators and hydro units and anything that has like a rotating mass to it provides a lot of system security to the grid. And we're going to have less and less of that in the future. So we've got to figure out a way to incentivize these essential reliability services and, and I think pay for them. Wanna just in my own mind here. So from an RA perspective, like ERCOT and their January, you know, freeze over that they had a couple of years ago, yeah, right? Really, yeah. This is exactly what you're trying to address. That's exactly right. Okay. Yeah, that's exactly it. Um and and to that point, this the study that we used to run didn't really take into account things like an extreme winter storm and ex, uh, an extended heat wave. Um, these sort of more extreme weather events are kind of looked at like, uh, what's an average year? Let's make sure we can meet an average year. But what we're seeing now is we need to take in some of those extreme risk hours into account when we're running the market that, that, that actually ensures resource adequacy. And so we've made some changes to that, and um, and that's 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 big because I think you know what used to be a one in one hundred year event is much more frequent. So just as a, a quick follow up on that, then so with this energy transition that you've already experienced from coal over to gas, right. and knowing that you know ERCOT part of the freeze knocked a lot of the gas pressurized systems yeah. offline, which then took their merchants offline. Is that part of the scenario? Thinking you know, part further north, it could actually happen more broken? Yeah. yeah, yeah, big time. Okay. It's it's part of all of this. Um, right. Again, immediate, it's part of this. Um, and we've been doing a lot of work to make sure that gas generators, because we had a winter storm called Winter Storm Elliot. I don't know if folks remember this. It was Christmas Eve 2022. Yeah, Christmas Eve 2022. Extreme cold weather across the entire PJ region. I happened to be in Chicago at that time, and it was unbelievably cold. And um, our gas fleet on those couple of days performed terribly. Like it was an outage rate that we hadn't seen ever. Um, nearly half of the gas fleet just didn't perform, couldn't turn on. So it's really, really poor. The costs of that event were astronomical, um, extremely close to very, very serious reliability situation in PJ. And so we've made a lot of changes to um, how folks need to Crack the generators in the winter to make sure we get better performance. And if you don't perform, stronger penalties. Um, so that kind of goes into the extreme weather. Like we need to support resource performance. Like we really have to get the most out of our generators as we go through this transition. So that speaks to that. But then it also goes into like the model that we're running for resource adequacy. And it also goes into essential reliability services. What do you need during really extreme weather events or other extreme um, operating scenarios? What are the crucial reliability services that you have to have during those? And figuring out what are they? How much do we need? Should we run a market? The price of services? Is it something that can be pro competitively procured? If not, we'll have to figure out another way to remunerate folks for it. You can run an RFP type um, type process for it. But um, I think sort of meeting the moment of extreme weather events runs across all of these um, in the energy. Now, I noticed that you know, FERC and NERC put out a final report back late last year on yep. Winter Storm Elliot. Yeah. That's a, I think that's a real informative look at, at uh, what happened and what can't happen in PJM that alarmed more folks than even the Texas situation. Yeah. I mean, never let a crisis go to waste. I mean, nobody would wish a winter storm Elliot again um, on the region. 
for winter storm Uri in Texas. I mean, I think like 400 people died in that storm. It was a terrible event. Um, but I think we've used it to our advantage to, to sort of recognize that we can do better in, in uh, extreme weather events like that, and, and it's worth planning for them in a more explicit way. Can you comment then on the role of renewables, specifically Energy Storage Incorporated with solar in the context of this? And are we missing the mark in Virginia, of course, if that's what you represent, but are we missing the mark or is, do you see any storm clouds in that, in the policy that exists right now? have a greater reliance upon renewables for these critical events. So for instance, a four hour duration uh, battery to be able to maintain critical systems so that you can keep your urgence up and running and things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think we're trying to provide folks with the information that's necessary to recognize what potential issues they might have. And what I mean by that, let's go to the next slide. I think it's the next slide. Uh, let's we'll come back to interconnection stuff. Can you go ahead two more? One, two, yeah, this one. Okay. So in that intermediate term issue around resource adequacy, I think this may get to your question yeah. around resource adequacy. Some of the changes that we've made have been the way in which we model how much how many megawatts we're going to need to cover the riskiest hours of our system in the future. So we've baked in more extreme weather type scenarios into that analysis. And that helps us understand those are riskiest hours that we perceive during that particular year. So we, we actually run a model that is hourly and it tells us, are we meeting our load on an hour to hour basis? 870, 800, 8,760 hours in that particular year. Um, can we meet the load? And that includes more sort of weather related risk now. So that's a change that we made. But then another change we made is okay, now we have a better assessment of what the particular hours in a given year are that are the riskiest for us in terms of not being able to meet our load. But now we need a way to compare who contributes to those riskiest hours. What generators contribute to those riskiest hours? So if that is January 10th at 4 a.m., we run a model and we say there's a, there is a significant risk in that hour of not meeting our load. We then need a way to figure out, well, what generators are more valuable during those hours? And there is a methodology that's being fairly widely used in the industry globally called effective load carrying capability. Those words basically mean what resources are most effective at meeting the load during your riskiest hours. And we now use this system in our capacity market to price generators. It's a way to compare apples to apples. So I said earlier, when a coal plant retires or a gas plant retires, if it's a thousand megawatts, we can't replace, again, from a resource adequacy perspective, we can't replace that generator with a thousand megawatts of solar. It's not one for one. You can't even replace it with a thousand megawatts of nuclear. You can get very close. But even a thousand megawatts of nuclear might not exactly replace it one for one. So this system and all these percentages that you see up here is a way to do that. And what it basically says is if you have a fixed tilt solar facility, what's the what, what number of megawatts of that particular facility? can sort of compare to a natural gas plant or another thermal generator. Another, it's actually really another perfect generator is kind of what the model says. And you can see that that number is really, really low. Meaning if you, I don't know if I can do this math in my head, but like if you retired a 100 megawatt generator, thermal generator, and you built a 100 megawatt solar facility, 
only seven megawatts of that facility would sort of be used to backfill that retired generator. So you need other stuff to build up to that 100 megawatts. So you might get seven megawatts from the solar facility. You might get 38 megawatts from a new hydro plant. You might get 56 megawatts from a four-hour storage. Okay, great. We've met. Uh, we've now met 100 megawatts that we needed from those resources. Again, it's a way for us to compare apples to apples. It's a way for the industry to understand what the needs of the system are for resource efficacy. And what I mean, just to highlight, basically, it shows you like there's not a ton of value from a resource adequacy perspective in solar. Meeting the most critical hours that we need, solar is not the resource that really is going to do that. Battery is pretty good. Yep. Right now, 56% from a four hour battery, 76% from a storage facility. 76%, by the way, this list goes on and on and on with other generators that didn't show here, but 76% is about the same percent as you would get from a natural gas uh, combined cycle unit. So a 10 hour battery could sort of replace a natural gas combined cycle unit from a resource adequacy perspective, pretty like one-to-one. -one. So I'm okay. a little short on time. Uh, yeah, yeah, sorry. Actually, okay. have time for a couple of questions. Yeah, a couple of questions. This is just a dumb one off. Or why does offshore go from 60 to 20? Where is the storage? Yeah, so there's a couple of, um, yeah, why do these numbers change? And first of all, the top here are what we call delivery years. So this, this is basically, um, a year in the future, and we run this model out to 2034, 2035. So each column is a future year. And you can see that these numbers change mostly for this resource class. They go down as you get more and more. That's because these values are marginal. And what it's meant to show you is what is the incremental value of adding the next megawatt of solar? And basically, like if you think about it just at a high level, the more and more solar you add, it all behaves the same, just solar, not compared to storage range. If you just add more and more solar, all that solar comes on in the morning, peaks in the middle of the day, and comes off at night. So the more and more you add, you aren't really doing anything to meet critical hours that might happen very early in the morning or very late in the evening. So the, the, the signal here is adding more and more solar is not going to help us meet resource adequacy as the system changes. There's another way to put that as you add more solar, your critical hours shift because yes. it begins to cover with solar some of the top load hours, but now your top load hours become further out in the shoulders. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So when it comes to, like you mentioned Elliot, how much of the need during Elliot did, and the, during the peak hours of Elliot, did solar provide? Very little. Yeah, so mo most of, uh, many of the critical hours during Winter Storm Elliot were very early in the morning. So it would, you know, five gigawatts more of solar made a difference in LA. When 10 gigawatts of solar made a difference in those peak hours from a planning standpoint, if you're done. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I don't want to necessarily say offhand, but my hunch is no, probably would not have done a lot. Wind contributed um, a, a little bit better than expected um, during that during that event, um, but again, not you know wasn't a huge contributing factor just because of the amount we have. We don't have a lot of wind, but. Um, yeah, so that's this is really the signal that um, in order to meet resource adequacy, we need the right resource mix. And what we're trying to do here is let the market know how valuable different resource types are to meeting our most critical peak hours. Again, our job is not to say in 2034, 2035, we need this amount of gas, this amount of batteries, this amount of solar, this amount of wind. We're not trying to pick a fuel mix. We want the market to pick the right fuel mix. What we're trying to do is give the market the right signals to understand 
where the bound is in different resource types. So yeah, a couple of quick questions. What um, what factors are considered for a particular key position on the first ready first serve perspective? What are you looking at to determine they're ready? Um, this is a good question. I don't know exactly, other than there are things like um, I know site control is a huge issue there. Um, there may be other factors related to the the availability of the generator model. Um, I don't know all of the factors off the top of my head for the first ready, first serve. Like what, yeah, what makes a project more ready than another project? I think is what you're asking. Yeah, and then um, you guys have a great map on your website showing the inflow and outflow of energy from state to state within yeah. the market. And yeah. every day, Virginia's importing four to five gigawatts at every moment of energy from other states. How should that you know, inform the way about energy generation in the future? Yeah, there's a couple of different ways to think about that. Like, um, I think states, um, you know, one way to think about that, not being, not, not representing a particular state, one way that I would think about that is the the broader market that we're a part of in the PJM region is providing a benefit, meaning you don't have to go it alone in a larger sort of grid like PJM or like MISO or like SPP. You don't have to be self-sufficient as a state in terms of your energy resources. Washington, D.C. has zero generation. <laughs> they just rely on everybody else generating to import and serve their load. And there's a benefit in that. There's a very real benefit in that. It's part of the key value proposition of a regional transmission organization. You're part of a broader resource set, and therefore you're getting the most efficient energy to your state by way of that. Now, if you represent a state and that state wants to have 100% clean energy and all you're doing is importing gas and coal, you might have a problem with that. And so you might want to build enough resources in your state that you are more self-sufficient, if you will, with the types of resources that you want. Um, and that's a very valid goal. Um, and, you know, information that we put out as to how much generation is happening within each state and what the transfers are, you know, help helps folks understand, okay, well, how do we get to a state where we are generating as much energy as we use? But yeah, you don't have to do that. I mean, that's like I said, there, there are states that are very generation deficient and they rely on the resources outside of their state to, to serve their load. And the PJM market is selecting the most cost efficient resources to serve that work. Yeah, thanks, Scott. I think we could post questions to you for another couple of hours. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, you know, I put my contact on the slides um, so you can email any questions that you have out to the back. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. thanks for having me. Uh, Vice Chair Duncan. Thank you. So, Dr. Scott, I've known each other since our case at Virginia Tech. Um, I think the topic that he's going to discuss is appropriate for us in a, in a couple different respects. Uh, in other work, we interviewed a number of utilities saying, what's the thing that worries you the most? And the uh, snowball coming down the mountain is electrification and the needs to meet electric vehicles. So I think Vermont is sitting right at the intersection of that. They have visibility with states that border us and some of the pre-discussion that, that Glenn and I had before this. Uh, there are policies in other states that I think are, should be at least in our discussion uh, radar, uh, if not the recommendations that we go forward so with that. I thought Glenn would bring a unique perspective 
uh, from here within the Commonwealth to, to be able to, uh, to educate us and um, get our, our creative juices things, much like Scott just did with interconnection that we could talk another, or with PJM that we could talk another hour, I'm sure. So with that, uh, Dr. Scott. Please. Thanks, Paul. Um, now, you all have some business after this. How much time do you want me to read? Um, all these topics we could all talk for an hour or so. I think we could probably wrap it up in 15 minutes. Yeah, I'll go, I'll go quick. 18 slides, 15 minutes. I can do it. Yeah. Oh, we can do more than 15 minutes for sure. Oh, yeah, you got a half hour. Okay. Um, Easily. So just from background, yeah, Paul and I have known each other 30 years, 32 years to be honest. Scott and I, I, I realized we, we met as we came in and then we went back and it was 2009, I went back and looked at my email. Then, my first email back when you were at UW um, wow. uh, about the cool. projects we were doing back then. I've been doing, my, I'm in now at Vermont Energy, which is based out of Charlottesville, but I was, uh, Paul and I met in, in, in Blacksburg, which is a tech back in the 90s. Um, I'm a power electronics guy, I'm a power electronics engineer, uh, not a markets person, not a policy person, but I'm going to talk about something. So, uh, in my energy, what do we do? We, we are a vehicle to grid, or be the next. Services provider, oh, software company, basically. Uh, it's the idea to use vehicles as store as rolling stored energy, and we are we operate them to be able to say when to charge and when to discharge. I'll go through some of that. Um, this is going from that big picture, where all everything's in gigawatts and in large numbers, down to Res, you know, down to small vehicles and uh, light commercial vehicles and you. So let's, let's, so the topic was common with issues that may impede, and I said, or speed development of EVs and EV chargers. Because <laughs> it'd be like, okay, how can we uh, uh, build this up? So I was going to go through context or some background of the energy and the storage. What well, we consider the four pillars of the X market foundation across the country, across different markets. Some of the regulatory challenges and opportunities we see, and then some recommendations. But let's let's get into it. So, big picture, energy storage. Where are the batteries going to be? They're going to be in the vehicles. They're not as much as we think. You know, it would be the stationary storage solutions. Um, there's some in buses, a lot of electric, and passenger EVs. Passenger EVs are going to be where the large bulk of energy storage is, and they're parked 95% of the So they're stationary most of the time and available. And it's a huge resource that is available for uh, the grid. Yeah, just going to the next. And by nameplate, if you put a kilowatt per car charger, they'll cross over the, the coincident peak load in 11 years. Uh, if you just said all of them charging at the same time, this is why everybody's hair is on point, right? This is a huge amount of load or capacity available to the grid. And these graphs are like, okay, if you just took all the cars, nameplate, higher prediction, crosses over. Um, and then these the dotted lines are a penetration of vehicle to grid as, a, as an ability to address that low, medium, and high. Obviously, it's not, the assumption is not we're going to do all of the vehicle to grid. But, but it is kind of in, it's in this scale of gigawatts that we're talking about. Okay, let's get forward. So again, the, the, the transition of electric, the electrification of transportation or trans, the TV as it gets called. Um, big picture, you know, we, we've talked about this already, but the big thing is the transition to EVs, hockey stick curve, 
Um, additional issue, particularly for Virginia, we talked about already data data center growth, particularly in Northern Virginia, we're getting a lot of where the capacity needs. It's also overlapping at the same time with EV adoption things. And so we've been talking a lot with people in that region about how can Vita X be a resource that can also be planned for in the 15 year horizon scout talking about. Again, so this is big picture. So going to the next. And so state policies around the country say, okay, let's set some goals for when we're going to be target date for clean energy, when was the goal adapted, and different kinds of things that are concepts in the adoption. We, we look at this across the country and you know our relative states, some are more aggressive than others. Virginia is got something and is um, not doing everything everything everybody else is doing, but doing something has a de declaration for that. If you want. What's ACII? Oh, you don't, don't. I said I'm not a policy guy. I said I'm not mm -hmm. a policy guy. Um, related to it. Clean cars to clean car standard. Okay. okay. And clean cars. Yeah. Okay. You can try it to basically be able. Yep. Thanks. So, and also Virginia has some policies now on EV charging and, and some, some encouragement, some rebates, some rules about rights to charge and things like this. But there's not a, a, a ton of grant programs in the state of Virginia or particularly for vehicle. Let's go to the next. So, as I said, the, the formation of the v, V2X market formation, interconnection, we talked about the interconnection queue. Here we're talking about distribution interconnection, which is uh, you know solar energy. Anybody who can you get your house, you have to get an interconnection before you get the solar panels on your house. Compensation for doing something, incentives to do it, and then participation protection in being able to say, I, I know I'm going to be able to participate in that. Let's go forward. So this is what we've been doing across the country. And what our, I won't go into all the technical details of our will be our particular solution, but it's small. It's 15 kilowatts, 20 kilowatts, not kilowatts, not megawatts, not gigawatts. Um, small light commercial deployments across the country. Different utilities, different states, um, different programs. All of these, though, are per car per charge. And this is a Nissan Leaf, almost all of them, because it, it is the one the vehicle that is bidirectionally enabled for the past 10 years. And one charger in 15 or 20 kilowatts. This is the revenue, annualized revenue or annual or the revenue we've captured with one car or one charger in various markets across the country. Um, either a fleet operating site, utility site, you know, where they're just doing something. We've done a lot in New England. Uh, Colorado is a very good state for us. We have not done very much in California. California has been difficult to cite any do that. Um, when you say revenue, what what is the revenue source? Can you talk a little bit about that? So, and what is it? Are you selling so, electricity back that you purchased, or what? Right. So, one of them, like we could talk the, the frequency regulation market. It's not a great market for this, unfortunately. We did do a project. Scott back in Danville, uh, 2015 or 16, where we did, we were a talent service provider and we aggregated four cars into this PJM and we sold in the frequency regulation market. And we made like a dollar and a half a day, <laughs> right? And it was a lot of work. It wasn't a lot of money for the regulation market. But there are other things. The two big ones are demand response to demand or charge management, right? We, where in a market like San Diego, where you are charged not just for your kilowatt hours, but your peak load. Right now it's like $60 a kilowatt for peak load um, of your for our month average. You know, anytime during the month, 15 minute average, what's your peak? And you get charged that times 60. So if we can take that and take 20 kilowatts off it, we earn money right there. That's the majority, uh, the most of the market, like the ones in Colorado, there's a, we use a fleet vehicle and it has averaged about $300 a month for three years 
by just doing that, limiting its demand per month. And, it, and so they'd save money on their guy. Um, other ones like demand response, like the collect, Connected Solutions um, Program in New England, it is a retail, the utility will say, tomorrow, please reduce your demand a certain time. And by, based on whether or not we perform, we get paid and the customer actually gets a check. In that case, they had a summer program. They responded in 90 days to a certain number of summer peaks by reducing their load. And they got a check for $4,500 from the utility for 90 days worth of participation in one car. And, the, and it was like 95% performance. It was the grid operators like, give me more of these. They were extremely low performance, like the, what uh, Scott was talking about. Battery, power electronics were very responsive to that kind of thing. So, yeah, I can go to, we can go through different ones with different places. Okay, so what, what we learned around the country, interconnection, interconnection, we can't do this, we can't be these uh, small distributed generators if we can't get connected to the grid, and, and there's a lot of issues with that. One is, we're a, an odd duck. We don't fit into categories. So we may not be the right. We, we, there's things that are being applied to us that make sense in transmission, but they make sense that at, at large scale deployment, but they don't make sense when you're 15 kilowatts, 20 kilowatts of residential. Um, so we would love it if we could get appropriate size thresholds for small generators. Um, we're, we don't get a lot of, you know, it takes too long to get cited. We didn't have some time to throw something in and we don't know if anybody's ever going to read our application, et cetera. Dispute, we get into difficulties with um, public utility commissions as to what kind of equipment we have and whether it's suitable to go on the grid. There are difficulties for V2X specific commissioning processes. They're mostly written for solar. And or for uh, stationary residential storage, particularly around things like net energy, net zero net energy or self consumption. The battery in a car is not always there. So there's some things that don't make sense in the classification. And then also, there's we'd, we'd love it if we could get V to X to be considered equivalent to energy storage. Um, for the interconnection process, a lot of them don't know how to treat the events um, as, a, as a technology. Um, okay, so let's move on. So, and Question. in terms of the way your technology is set up in a home, do you have a stationary battery as well as the EV battery? And you're using or a stationary battery as like the Intermediary? Uh, one, none of the ones we've been doing have been residential yet. We're doing commercial. Uh, we do three phase 480 type of uh, connection okay. um, at the commercial level. Residential you know, vehicle grid is still not really on the market, but as people talk about deploying it, yes, a lot of them will say it will. Not everybody will say let's co-locate with a distributed uh, a storage battery, but the most popular one is yes, you would have because if you had a backup system and you drove the car to go to the market and get some cake or something, it was a part. Um, you your demand, then, you your demand charge. then the house gets dark, so you need to have a small battery if you're running the, the house mm -hmm. while you're gone. Whatever. So. Um, but what it does do is means that you don't have to pay as much for stationary storage capacity. I mean, you can put a five kilowatt hour battery, in, but you've got 65 kilowatt hours in the car. You don't need to put in a 25, 30 kilowatt hour battery in your house, find room for it and pay the cost and have it sit there, not used 99% of the time, except for during backup. Yeah. So, it, but it, that that is the, a coming market that is not one that we're currently in. Um, this is just talking about what we were talking about for 
distributed energy resources, DER output, they're all over the place. They could be here in the sun could shine, whatever there's, there's there's some intermittency. That's kind of we've been having to keep them limited below a certain level based on their their peak of anything for the year, but we've seen flexible interconnection rules start to allow more penetration of DER as long as we can do some things where they may exceed you know, load requirements or where they may come into um, uh, higher peaks where we can, we can program them and make them flexible to, to curtail their output or so that we keep frequency in line, et cetera. So those are, that's something that's happening in the market as well. Go forward. All right, so electrification, utility, res resiliency, all of these go together to be the next market. That's the Running short time. So I talked about the pillars of things, one of them being compensation. How do we get paid? How do we encourage companies to build the equipment, solve the pro technical problems, know that they're going to get paid back? Um, where are they going to earn value? One of them is to be able to stack value, to be able to do both behind the meter, distribution level, wholesale markets. All of them can be addressed by storage in different ways. Um, this is where a lot of policy comes in and has been important around the country. For example, Maryland's Drive Act, I have a slide on that next, um, requires utilities to pilot programs for VDEX for distribution services programs. California's got their emergency load reduction program where they've got explicit Vita X is allowed to participate. Um, New England's got connected solutions with where v, v, Vita X is also allowed. Um, there's another program in California to start the DSGS that just got, got put out. So there are programs where Vita X is being allowed to get compensation for the participants. Next. So this is the Maryland Drive Act. What did they, Maryland really did take a big step with this. Um, it got signed this year. It's next year. Talking about V to X interconnection um, at, and rules for how to do so and how to get compensated and collaboration with the utility and putting out energy pilots. And we're already seeing you know, cooperation with different vendors. Um, Different you know, the industry associations and program grants that are getting on those. We're, we're involved in some of those, but that is a, a clear program from the state. It's really changed the market in many ways. In many ways, they're leading the country. Next. Any questions on Maryland's drive? So, um, other incentive opportunities, parity with stationary storage, things like California has their SGIP, which is a small federated program where they compensate stationary storage. Um, and it's just um, a great deal for stationary storage. And vehicle to grid is not, not eligible because they said, well, it wasn't written that way. And so you we don't treat you as storage, so you're not allowed to participate. So instead of programs that are comparable for those for stationary storage, upfront performance based incentives, um, integrate VDAX and utility planning processes, like Scott was talking about, as you're going forward. Start planning on the capacity that will be in the vehicles and what do we need to do to make sure they interact well, right? And also to allow the next to dual participate. A lot of times we will get something where we go to apply for a program and say, well, you're not eligible for this program because you're also getting something else. And while we're providing value, we should be able to get compensation. And we've done that, for example, we can do simultaneously demand response and demand charge management for our customers. So we can earn them money by reducing their demand charges and participate in demand response at the same time, saves them money. Uh, Made to it. There's a lot of funding for the DV transition to be able to install the conduit and the, and the chargers and get everything ready for EV charging. 
a lot of bi-directional chargers are not eligible for that. And it would be great if we could access for bi-directional chargers, get the same make ready funding opportunities that are available for D1G or for control charging or level two chargers. Uh, okay, go to the next slide. If you can. Um, Glenn, do you have, we don't get into this today, but do you have details on why V2X is not included in Make Ready and, and these other? Do you have the detailing? Well, I'll give you it's kind of an earlier thing where people like we're not duck. Like V1G, they, people, the, the regulations that are written are written for standard chargers. Like level two chargers are AC chargers. And they're in the law as you know J1772 level two charger, which is the AC charger. What we would do for by commercial and also for residential, most of the G is going to be DC chargers, but they're low power DC chargers. DC chargers in general are DC fast chargers. So they're corridor chargers, chargers are going to go get 300 kilowatts or 500 kilowatts. VDG works well as a DC. Charger, BDG DC, or technology. So you have a residential DC charger, just like a solar on your wall. But those types of chargers don't exist in the code because it's not a level two charger. For res all residential are level two chargers. So it's just a language thing, but there's no category for us to fit into. Because, well, you're not a level two charger and you're not a DC fast charger, therefore you're not. Um, participation protection, this is probably a lot of the same things. Um, PPAs were great for solar when they came on. You know, you could you power purchase agreements, long-term things. This is this is what we've been doing for revenue certainty. A connected solution provides a five-year out for the year. So we can we can participate and say, we know if we install this, we'll be able to be uh, we can put that in, it pencils out a lot better for now, like every year is this going to exist in there. Um, there's some issues where we could address concerns regarding battery wear and life and R&D and VGG impacts. I can go on and on about that. This is something we do a lot of work with. Our company is the only company that has an agreement or an, OE, an auto OEM where it said, we will not void the warranty for vehicle to grid as long as you use Vermont Energy's charging system um, because they know we take care of that. And this is one of the, you know, in the last few years, this has been like one of the number one issues people always have. Well, I don't want to give my battery cycles to the utility. They didn't pay for it. What am I going to do if I, now my battery is no good? The warranty, the, 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 the auto we have won't back the warranty and allow them to do this. These are things that we're doing and these are hurdles in the industry and these are these are things where we can get participation protection if we can either address some of these warranty issues or set up systems for uh, data privacy and security are always an issue when we talk about generators now you're talking about if we if this goes to 100 million chargers in the country around all of them being potential generators on the grid you now have cyber security issues that need to be addressed on the grid and each one of them is a data access point to your grid something we're very into okay, go on next yep i should say next 20 seconds before right <laughs> so Last slide, back to conclusions and recommendations. For V to X to scale well in the country, it needs to be fundamental to the transportation electrification planning now and not an afterthought later. This is moving very, very quickly as opposed to what Scott's been talking about, the utility, which has by its nature, takes years to construct and has to be planned so far in advance. It is very, very difficult to have the utility and the auto industry trying to work together. They work on very different time scales. Auto is slow, utility is much slower, but this technology is moving extremely quickly, or it would like to be. 
by its nature it wants to figure it out. Um, and the funding mechanisms, it's on the scale, it's on the speed of computers and market and, and hardware development, um, but not a utility. It's kind of a, it's difficult. So I so policy option would be set an RPS for storage for a country, for a state, and include data access point. Uh, need to ensure the connection is not a barrier. Policy option might be just clarify rules as data access DDR. Very kind of clear um, that it can be treated as a battery energy storage system, whatever you need to do to, serve to, to site solar or uh, a DER, uh, beta X can, can use that. Uh, and I say beta X because it includes to the grid or to the home or to the building. Uh, beta X needs supportive policies to scale, access upfront incentives. Policy option and VVX eligibility. DC chargers not limited to DC master. So it's like very simple things that could be changed, that could be put into the law. Ensure access to infrastructures, power with VVX, including DC level one chargers eligible for the same infrastructures as AC uh, level two chargers. That is the key one for residential when we start talking about, or even like commercial, we're talking about parking lot for. Place like this library where they may want to install a bunch of chargers, they might be able to find a grant fund to install some other few chargers, uh, but not if they're bi-directional or one easy. I have a question that's kind of the other kind of those presentations, and that is based on what we saw before on the chart that has all the numbers on it. Mm -hmm. Would you consider this a or would you consider the vehicle batteries like a four hour battery? Where are they on your scale of batteries? And do you consider them from an ELCC standpoint higher and lower or the same as whatever the four, six hour, yeah. whatever battery you, uh, you, can, you bit, consider it? In a little bit depends, but we would consider it on the ELCC. By the way, we've got mechanisms for these tiny, tiny resources to participate in the wholesale market. You know, aggregate them together, you can bid them in just like the generator. So we would consider them on the ELCC um, mechanism. And as to whether or not they're for it, they, they are long duration batteries for sure. I mean, almost most cars, the battery and the power interface makes it a multi-hour duration battery. I don't know whether it's four or six or eight or 10. It probably depends on the setup, mm -hmm. but we would, the, the person bidding it into the market would clarify that for us and then we would treat it in that ELCC resource. Yeah. But, but, do you, but it's like as part of the ELCC, like the percentage, would you consider the same, less, yep. or? Uh, so it would be whether if, if, if Glenn aggregated these vehicles and said, look, we got a whole fleet of these vehicles, in some, as an aggregate, it's a 50 megawatt, four hour battery. We would say, okay, great. It goes in the chart with the four hour batteries, that's how we model it, and we get the same rating as a four hour grid scale battery. Yeah, and some of these programs like the demand response programs, they there are our participation to be required that we be there for four hours a day and and they and they would send us the signal and we get paid whether by whether or not we were there. Our performance was very good. But if we but if we weren't there we didn't get paid as much. Um, the only modification I would make to that is you might say we aggregate a bunch of them, and statistically, 71% of them are going to be plugged in during that period. We might multiply that 67% and deals in feet by 0.7 for that. But each individual one, if it were plugged in, and you, yeah, you could do some stochastic, stochastic things to figure out you know, what on average. I have one question in order to go against time here, but I'm interested in sort of this, the scale. You get the essence policy that I think would be very helpful to scale, but I mean, the scale of EV as a storage device is, is massive. I mean, the amount of batteries that are being deployed as electric vehicle batteries is huge. Yeah. Put it in perspective, because we're here in Virginia, every time half a percent of the cars in PJM electrify, 
It's the same amount of storage as Bath County Pumped Hydro, which right. is the largest pump storage hydro plant, I think, in the world still. Yeah, it's always usually something larger in China, but I think it's still the largest pump storage facility in the world. It's like 30,000 megawatt hours. Half a percent of the cars in PJN electrified, we deploy another Bath County. I mean, it's just the scale is massive, but the key is how do you scale it in a way that it's controllable for the grid? Right. And these policies will help, and kind of interesting glimpse whether there are other like technical um, aspects of vehicle to grid that need to change in order to to help scale. Like, do these cars need to roll off the auto OEM line as one hundred percent V two G capable? Yeah, there 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 are real chicken and egg technical issues that are the market's still trying to shake out, yeah. which is why we still have the Nissan Leaf as the only vehicle that. Right. Fully bi directionally capable of the US market. Yeah. And then you can actually buy them on your phone. Yeah. Um, uh, so, yes, there are issues. That's why I spend half my time on technical committees of writing, you know, new IEEE and UL and SAE standards for what needs to happen. And there's a lot going on. It's moving slower than I would like, but it's also very thoughtful. And um, uh, is is moving in pace. I mean, I think that you know, particularly there's there there's a, there's an awful lot of work. I mean, do you see a day where we just go buy an electric vehicle and we plug it into our two hundred and forty volt residential charger and it's fully bidirectional and capable right there? Uh, well, we do that now with the Nissan Leaf. We yeah. plug, we plug it in. It's fully by that our charger makes it fully by the AC. No, the VDG AC is is a whole different kettle of fish. I don't have an hour and a half. Okay. Right. <laughs> but uh, regulatorily, it's probably another five to ten years before that comes to the US market. Yeah. I, I actually chair a committee on that. Yeah. And the, our, the fights are. Yeah. Okay. So, um, but there are. It's like. Apple against Microsoft type of fighting between yeah. BTG AC and BTG DC. Yeah. Europeans strong in that case. They have a different grid. Yeah. Thank you, Robert. All right. Really good. Just last slide. Contact information is there. I'll try to speed through this as quickly as possible, and I would love to take advantage of Vince being here for any working energy updates you might be able to provide. But um, finally, uh, two weeks ago, we got confirmation from the Attorney General's office that we can submit whatever report we want to. Um, we have full reign to to do that and submit it to the leaders in the General Assembly and the Governor's office to. Uh, the code points us towards for that uh, submission. So we'll move forward with the submitting of this report. Um, I believe in our January meeting, as you reflect within the minutes, we decided some of those changes, especially removing the proper nouns, names of counties, was going to be an appropriate change to make um, to the report, and we can move that forward. So it's very happy to get that buttoned up by the Office of the Attorney General. Apologies, it took so long that um, got tossed around to a couple of different attorney portions that we got that feedback. So that helps us as we draft this report for 2024 and glad we're able to submit the 2023 one to the post that I'm going to on the website. Or... So we'll need to make the changes. Um, you know, the way it's been explained to me is that essentially the Department of Energy could post it or could not post it, but we will need to submit it to the leaders within the General Assembly, probably just via email. And if it gets published, which we certainly hope it will, you know, go on the website. Okay. No worries, we're, we're done voting. So. Thank you, Greg. Um, moving on. Um, you all probably know we're about 11 months away from the um, sunset of the authority. I encourage folks to start thinking about uh, ideas for a re-up if we want to, uh, or even legislators want to um, 
re up the authority for another five years, I believe. Just keep that in the back of your mind. I believe our sunsets July one of next year. So um had some conversations with some folks on LP authority about what that could look like if we wanted to make any changes to um, what our charter includes, um, subtractions or additions. Ultimately, it's a the legislature, but wanted everybody to be aware of that on the uh, year long horizon. Um, we're about at the year mark of Paul and I on the authority as chair and vice chair. If anybody else wants to. Uh, participate or run for an office, please let Ken know prior to the next meeting, Ken or Aaron. Um, there's nothing in our bylaws to say that we have terms necessarily, but um, historically folks have left the authority and filled that vacated seat, but I think we'd be very happy to um, share the responsibility with anybody who's really wanting to, to take the reins. Um, and then lastly on my end, we want to keep a close eye on some new topics for our future meetings. Um, I know we've been talking about the data center coalition for almost a year now, and every day we propose doesn't seem to work for them, but I believe they might have tentatively accepted the October date. I'll have to go back and, and look at that, and if we shift that October date, I'd certainly like to, to hear from them. Um, Catherine, I know you mentioned at one point long range and energy storage in the pilot project that'd be an excellent one to, to do in October if we get a menu rep and form energy to come and share their 100 hour pilot program in like a, I believe. Um, does anybody else have any ideas they'd like to share and help us arrange for the October meeting? I was I really reached out to SCC um, State Corporation for interconnection just to get their perspective, kind of you know from a, a Virginia what they're seeing and how they're where they see areas for improvement and back. So let me keep pushing on that and see if we can get get somebody there to speak. But I get the impression I don't know this for sure, but they feel like they're dancing on a razor blade. So I don't know if they're when you come from SCC, thank you, Paul. Yeah. Any other any ideas from areas in the state that you talk make us not possible? Just that's just a comment. So, posting meetings in other parts of the state. Mm -hmm. um, what is your, do you have any thoughts or ideas there, Joanne? I'm just just to draw out the yeah, ending industry railroad. We always be in the Richmond area or whatever. So that's like the engineers that run the state, but there's a lot of things that we just talked about, which is other areas, but there are a lot of rural areas that are still having issues about this or lots of conversations about it. And I think today we have a meeting here. It might be productive, it might not. I just thought I had, you know, there's a lot of rural areas in Virginia that people have used solar energy, they can really use the, the tax base. Um, lots of areas that really are um, that fighting for hard that have terrible tax issues. Um, so just would any of them want to be on the agenda or would meeting to have a change in participation in any way? Like, so I, I guess I'm just asking for just clarification is the request to meet someplace differently or to add some perspectives to future agendas that might represent what you've described. It might just be two different yeah. things to navigate from those Um, I think that we might encourage people to come. I don't, I don't have the final number to say that to play mad and how much time it's been to know that she's give them. But I think, I think some of the counties are, most of the counties do have to do logical solar. People want to play, the lines are going I just think that's a real, real um, issue as far as solar production. I don't think we want to stretch our, our health and can never have other property lines are. I think that doesn't want really to come out unless it's maybe, you know, John Adams, whatever, if your private property property rights are not secure, you're not free man. And that was, you know, like the vital part of our of our of our constitution with the private property rights we do have it. And I think all the counties are currently completely almost finding that out when it comes to landowners. Yeah. You tend to see people on the lead. Sure, that's not on that. I, I do want to be mindful of those coming out from DC. I mean, yeah. um, you know, there are several folks that 
I'm drawing a couple hours down here, but maybe there's a middle ground. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we'll see with it. I also want to mention, and I appreciate that, but also want to mention that AES does have a, a few solar sites in Virginia, and if there's interest in doing a tour, that could be maybe arranged separately. Um, but if there's interest in hearing from other localities, uh, or if there's interest in maybe getting localities to talk to each other about solar experience and their solar concerns, that's something I could I could talk to our Virginia colleagues about. Any other ideas for future topics? Hearing none, please let us know if any come up. Um, I think we'll probably set for October, but you know, we might go ahead and some good ones. Um, Vince, any big updates to share on Virginia Energy? Is the new energy plan going to treat us okay? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, uh, quickly for those who don't know me, Vince May, I'm the director of the State Energy Office, took over for Al Christopher back in February. He was around partially till April, so we kind of overlapped a bit. Uh, I did come from, uh, I was the uh, actually the transportation lead before uh, taking over um, Al's role, and then I have 23 years experience at DEQ, uh, where I did environmental work, mediation, with the Brownfield and Brightfields League. So I have some cross agency experience. Uh, just really getting settled into the role, restructuring. The state energy office is having massive growth because of the money that we're getting from the federal government, where the grants we're pursuing. I think we've got $1.6 billion in potential funding that we're in pursuit of. We could end up managing close to a billion dollars in funding through the energy office, so that's a growth area. Uh, and we're getting more and more uh, involved in energy security and reliability issues uh, tied in with some of the federal rules. So that, that side of the house is growing as well. So we're staffing up and, and I, you know, I guess the best update I can give you is happened yesterday. Uh, Carrie Kern has left and went to cover this executive director of the sewer. Luckily, we were able to uh, find somebody to fill that role. Bettina Bergu, who many of you know, is going to step into the role as director of affordability and competition. Uh, she'll, she's already started right away because she's in the house. And we've uh, also hired Callie Highland. I don't know if any of you know Callie, uh, but she's going to take over as our associate director of what we're calling distributed generation solutions. But it'll manage the solar for all, the $156 million award program staff she'll manage that plus some other programs grant programs so we're kind of excited to get the team in uh she'll be in july 25th and it'll be a big asset to do our program so we're excited about that and just the energy plan is still in development and you know i think the governor energy conference is next week so uh you'll hear more about that from the man himself uh i'm sure at that event Thanks. And yeah, you know, one fun fact today in history, I think it was 1856, July 10th, Nikola Tesla mm -hmm. was born. And we're talking about AC power, you know, a pioneer of AC. He might be on the AC side of things, but he was still here, but I don't know. Great preparation. <laughs> <laughs> it came up on my famous people. Uh, like something I got this morning. That's like, oh, so fun. Okay. <laughs> um, anybody joining us virtually have any public comments to, to share? I'll be shy, lobbyists. <laughs> um, hearing none, we will. I, I did entertain a motion to adjourn to our tentative uh, October meeting. Date still a little bit TBD for uh, the general assembly rooms. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, being properly moved and seconded, the whole is favor. This is the trying to stay high. Any opposed? Thank you, everybody. Thank you to our presenters for this excellent, very good.